Hello guys, how's it going? Wednesday again. Do you know what? I'm beginning to think. What did I uh, title this live stream? I can't even remember now. It was inspired actually by, I don't know if any of you remember, a guy called Frenchy. This is going back to last June. He had his Mondeo, he's a Mark V Mondeo, two litre diesel. It was randomly going into limp mode. He has messaged me, left a comment, and uh, I will read it out in a bit, and I'm going to respond to it. I'm going to, if he's not listening, if you're not listening, Frenchy, I will, will respond to your comment in my comment section. So I will get to it. But he has an update because I put out a video explaining the checking procedure to go through to find the answer to the problem of your car. But your update, well, Frenchy's update is not what I expected, and something smells a bit fishy, so <laughs> I'm going to go through this in a little while. Anyway, let's see who we've got. Where are we to start with? Hello, Andy, how are you? I am doing fan-bloody-tastic. Do you know why? Because I've had a right shit, boring week up to now, up until... Late yesterday afternoon, then I had a rather interesting job come in. And today, I've had another interesting job come in. And in these two days, I have made two videos, which I have not put out yet. They're only short ones, like four or five minutes long for each one. But they're kind of interesting things. So I will put them out by this weekend. Anyway, Andy, thank you. I have a 2011 2 litre diesel C Max. My central locking has an electrical issue. When I unlock the car, it locks and unlocks itself for about five, six times. Have you come across? Do you know what I have on, uh, not on the C Max, I'm, I'm going back to the Ford Sierras now. They used to do a similar thing. You'd, you'd lock them and they'd, they'd lock and unlock constantly for a little while. It's probably a faulty latch in one of the doors. You're probably going to have to sort of like, it's going to take a little bit of a, I don't know whether you can plug a diagnostic tool into it through the body control module and it might read something on the latch inside and it might bring up a fault because there's, there's a lot, you know, the diagnostic tools can do these days. That would be the first call. The other thing would be to disconnect one door at a time and see if it still does it. And if it, does it, if it doesn't do it, well, you disconnect one certain door, then you know that door is your problem. So uh, as, of, as with everything, nothing's bloody easy. Hope you get some luck on it. Uh, Damien, hello. Can you advise on topping up with add blue for my Mark V Bondeo. Do I top up like windscreen wash or do I leave it until warning light? I don't like add blue. I think it's a bloody con. But anyway, what can you do about it? If your car has got add blue, well, I wouldn't buy it from the petrol stations though. They'll charge extra. You can get it from motor factors, probably cheaper. Uh, if it were me in my car, I would just keep it topped up like windscreen washer fluid. But it's not going to hurt to leave it until the light comes on. That's assuming the system's working correctly and it does notify you when it is low. But because, uh, yeah, the car, your car can literally conk out if it runs out of bad blue. Now, if it were me, I would just top it up as and when I feel like it. But it, like I say, don't worry, the light comes on. You, if you've got some in your boot, just put it in then. Whatever suits you best. Hello, Steve. How are you? Only the last Mon Monios, <laughs> Mondeos use Add Blue. Allens do not use it. Just keep the tank topped up. Yeah, none, none of the taxis we've got are, are use Add Blue. Flipping good job as apart from uh, the transits. We've got the, the 2019 Transit Tornio Custom. Bloody, that uses ad blue. Have you seen, have you seen what that shit does when it gets on the floor? It kind of like 
spreads it, it kind of grows like it's flipping mutating all over the place. It's horrible. It's like it's organic, it's alive or something like that. It's bloody horrible stuff. Anyway, nice to see you, Steve. I'm gonna I'm gonna send out some links soon on the next few live streams coming up. So if anyone wants to come and join me on the screen, then uh, just say, you know. <laughs> There is room for up to, I don't know how many people you can fit on this, but we'll have a go. We'll have a go one night. Hello, Matty. Good evening to you. It's that time again. I'm just going to give you a little tip here, which I found quite amusing. You know, you know, with this uh, cost of living bullshit and then all the energy crisis, you know, like I've got, <laughs> I've got an electric oven. See that? electric oven All right once you've finished cooking your shit what you do is you leave the oven door wide open that way the heat after you've taken your dinner out the heat will, will heat the room up so you leave it you don't shut the door again leave it open for 10 minutes that's my money saving tip all because the government caused all this bullshit in the first place it's a good thing they're paying for our... Who's got their electric bill paid for by the government? I, I'm paying about £9 a month at the minute for my electric bill. But I'm, I'm thinking when the government aren't subsidising it no more, I'm going to be paying about £80 a month. Hello, Malcolm. Hope you're doing okay. I'm doing okay. Most common causes of engine failure is the dipstick who forgot to do essential maintenance usually, or the taxi driver didn't notice the engine banging. Well, I'll tell you something. There's a lot of mechanics who, who do make some silly mistakes and it ends up in a bloody disaster. And I'm, to be honest with you, it can happen to the best of us. So, uh, but there are quite a lot of people out there who really shouldn't be touching a car and they are. <laughs> just so you know <laughs> but yeah I know what you mean and so some people so, some of the taxi drivers are really good slightest little thing they're around but other ones you know the, the wheel would literally have to depart the bloody car before they said something they'd even notice uh, Hara hello Bosnia flipping heck Bosnia Bosnia, yeah, that's a flipping, that's a way off, isn't it? Well, hello to you. Good evening. That's a nice place to visit. I, I've, I've actually watched some videos on, on Bosnia and that, and Croatia and all that. And the uh, <clears throat> one of these people who just walk down the street, they, they're totally silent, they don't speak. They just walk down the street with a camera attached to them, and they just walk around the streets. And all the you know the tourists and everything. It's quite interesting. It's quite nice over there. For for a Mondeos in the previous video that we talked about the generate the, the generations, I have read about the Fiesta Mark Eight called in the UK Mark Seven on Europe. Is this the same thing for a Mark Three Mondeo? Uh, I've, yeah, it's basically the same sort of thing. You know, they bring out a car and they do Mark 1, 2, 3 and so on. And they, unless it's Peugeot, they just give it a number. So yeah, it's this similar sort of thing. I meant that is called, that is called the Mark 3 in the UK, Mark 2 in Europe. <clears throat> I don't know what they call it in Europe. But you see, the, the, prob the problem is, as far as the Mondeos go, the Mark what the very first Mondeo that ever came out was called the Mark I Mondeo. The Mark II Mondeo was a facelift, so it was never intended to be the Mark II. It was just a facelifted Mark I. So technically, you could say that the Mark III Mondeo is the Mark II. But over here in the UK, we call it the Mark III. It's just caught on like that. 
But if you wanted to be sort of like, I don't know, <laughs> super right, I guess it is the Mark II. But it's too late now. Too many years have passed, and everybody just calls it the Mark III. So the Mark I, the Mark I facelift is the Mark II, and the Mark III is the Mark III. In Europe, I do not know what they call it. I would call it the Mark III. Anyway, you're getting me confused now. <laughs> I'm going to have to move on. <laughs> hello, hello, Mondo. How are you? Uh, I think waiting for a light to come on dash instead of doing a weekly check. The modern age of motoring. Yeah. I remember the days when there were no engine management lights and all that bullshit. <laughs> Bring back the Ford Sierra, please. And I'm sick of the people in Europe that are calling the third generation, but my opinion, it is the second generation. The Mark IV, third, third is most beautiful generation and modified as we see. Yeah, well, you see, whatever they call it over there is not what we call it over here. It's one, two, three, four, and five over here. So in Europe, if they want to call it one, two, three, and four, then... Who cares? <laughs> I wouldn't really worry about it. It's whatever you want to call it. But I think to be technically right, the Mark III would have been the Mark II. Do you think a lot of problems on diesels with AdBlue is putting tenors in tank instead of brimming it from empty so the correct dose is applied? I don't really, I've not had any ad blue problems. So, <laughs> mind you, I've, I, the, the vehicles we've got are very, very limited that have got ad blue, a couple of transits, and they haven't really caused any problems yet. So, I don't know, but it's, it's just another thing to go wrong, really, isn't it? But the, the ones we've got, the systems have not gone wrong. So, touch wood. Uh, My Ford mechanic advises motorway driving for five miles in fourth gear while car is doing more than 3,000 revs to burn carbon off EG, ERG. Is the, this something you'd advise? I, do you know what? To be honest with you, if you've got a modern diesel car, like you take the Mark V Mondeo, for instance, you shouldn't have to do that. I know in the past you would go down the motorway to, you know, you call it clearing the exhaust out. But these modern motor cars, they are designed to clear the DPF and make it clean. Uh, they do a very good job of it. Look at all the BMWs, how clean they are. As long as every, all the systems on the car is working correctly, then you shouldn't be. I mean, it does. I would advise to go down the motorway once in a while and give it a good blast. I mean, you don't want to be driving around town all the time because the bottom line is <clears throat> these cars, as good as they are, if you're just doing a couple of miles every day, starting up and the engine's not really getting warm, you're just going to town and back or around the corner and the, the, the car's not heating up properly, then there is a chance that, that, that it's not going to regen properly. Well, there's a very high chance, actually. So I would advise getting on the motorway and giving it a blast every now and again but you haven't got to sort of like stick to a certain rev range or a certain speed. They should generally just clear the DPF as they drive. And as all of our the taxis go, when everything's working fine on them, these cars drive around town a, whole, a hell of a lot. They do, and then they go out for a run and everything. They, they have very few problems. We do get DPF issues. I'll actually touch on a few of them tonight. So, uh, I'll get back to that in a bit. Hello, Sam. How are you? Uh, Tyler and Miss M. <laughs> I don't know where Tyler is. He's gone out. He'll be back in shortly. Uh, Mondo, I think extended service interviews and just add fuel mentally, mentality just increase internal wear 
and service inspections and MOT, I reckon a taxi can do 100k within three years, but all the checks within. Yeah. Well, you know, all these like longer service intervals and stuff like that, it's probably not such a good idea. Hello. It's a hoodie. <laughs> it's cold outside. My hands are like. Flipping, flipping hands. You should put, a, put your bloody gloves on. Ah, it's cold. It's cold. It's warmer in the freezer. It's warm in the freezer. My hands are heating up. That's global warming. That's why it's so cold. Global warming. That's what you've got to remember. The planet's warming up. I wonder why. <laughs> anyway, you're getting me off on one now, so I'm going to move on. Yeah, hold on. Well, I, I can't wait until like when uh, crude oil runs out because I want to see what happens. I'm assuming by then that have all moved to <coughs> Teslas, but yeah, we're not going to all move to Teslas, and we're not going to be living in tree houses and eating bugs. But we're running out of like certain people in the WEF would like us to. We can make them eat bugs. Uh, hello, Paul. How are you? Hey, yes, it, it's Wednesday night again. Anyway, tonight, I'll just go through this comment here. I have an issue with the radio on the Transit Connect button four isn't working. We don't have any transit connects, but I should think if button four is not working, then it's a dodgy connection behind the button. I would try try spraying some electrical cleaner on it and jabbing it. <laughs> I should think it's definitely your, your radio button as well. We... Yeah, I was going to touch on tonight just the, like the, the most common causes of the... I'm talking about the Mark V Mondeo, not the Mark IV, the Mark V 2-litre diesel... The most common causes of what causes the engine to either completely cut out and drop dead or go into uh, reduced power mode or limp mode, as you want to call it. And I was going to say the most I thought about this and I believe the most common problem on them cars. I'm going to go for the number one spot is your oil control solenoid. That's not your oil. Well, oil pressure control solenoid it's not your oil switch it's a solenoid with oil goes into and it sits next to your oil pressure switch and it actually sort of like controls that the amount of oil the oil pump pumps so it's it's kind of a useless bloody thing anyway if you took it off the engine and done away with it if you could do that you, you would there would be no benefit no benefit at all that i can see but it's there and it's it, it caused a problem because when these solenoids pack up, normally when you're, you can be driving normally, but normally when you're actually booting it, giving it some throttle, the car will go into limp mode and it will come up with these solenoids. I've done a video about it a while back and I seem to be having a lot of them play up recently and a lot of the cars we get in, we have a code for that solenoid and they're like £120 per solenoid. So that's my number one spot on why these cars go into limp mode. But of course, you're not going to know that unless you put a diagnostic tool into your socket or your car and read the ECU codes. So that's my number one problem. And I shall go to a number two problem in a minute. Uh, Sean, hello. Good evening, everybody. And good evening to Sean. Do you know what? It's flipping. How long have we been on this? 15, 17 minutes, 17 minutes, I've not even poured a bloody drink out. So, there. This Jack Daniels is lost in a flipping long time. As I, as I said at the beginning of this live stream, 
But the guy called Frenchy, who we've done a video on last June, he's giving an update, and it kind of coincides with what I'm talking about tonight. Because his problem is an all too familiar one, although it's, the, it's an update is a little bit strange. French's car was going into limp mode and I gave him a checking procedure, which basically entailed plugging in your diagnostic tool, reading the ECU codes. If you had low fuel pressure codes or fuel meter in something along those lines, you would first check your fuel filter. And on the Mark 5 Mondeo, I'm just going to point out here, the fuel filters are pretty small. If you compare the fuel filter on a Mark 5 Mondeo to a Mark 4 Mondeo 2 litre diesel, the Mark 4 filter is probably twice the size and lasts twice as long. The Mark 5 fuel filters can get blocked up. I've had a filter blocked up in 15,000 miles and literally caused the engine to go into limp mode because the fuel wasn't getting through it properly. Not that common a problem, really, and not that I've seen, because all the taxis we do, the filters are regularly changed. But I don't know about, you know, general run-of-the-mill cars that are out there that people own, whether they get the filters changed or not. I presume you do on your own cars. So I wouldn't put the, the fuel filters as, as like, like a very high number of cases that's causing problems, although in some it probably does. And then I said to, to, to Frenchy, if your fuel filter is okay, the next thing you want to do is do a fuel leak off test on your fuel injectors. So normally when these cars get to anything from 80,000 miles to 150,000 miles or more, you can get a scenario where when you put your foot down, say you're in six, four, fifth or sixth gear, you put your foot down to accelerate and the car takes a dump. It just goes, Wurr. and sometimes you have to pull over and actually switch the engine off or it die out by itself. You have to start it up again and you can carry on again and it's fine again until you put your foot down again. Generally speaking, that is because on maybe one, two or, or three or four, all four of the injectors, if you're very unlucky, too much fuel is being leaked, the injectors have gone weak inside. The internal components of the injectors are weak and it's allowing too much fuel to flow out of the injector back to the tank through the leak off pipes. And what's that, and what that is doing, it is lowering the fuel pressure in the fuel rail. And when you consider you've got an electric tank, electric pump in your fuel tank, pumping the fuel around to your high pressure fuel pump, which is bolted to your engine, the high pressure fuel pump just spins with the speed of the engine. All it does is pump fuel and it's going to kind of govern the pressure it will pump is governed by the engine ECU. But when the injectors are leaking off too much fuel, the high pressure mechanical pump can't keep up. It can't keep enough pressure in that fuel rail. That's why your ECU detects there's a, there's a drop in fuel pressure in your fuel rail. So it will it'll put the car into reduced power mode to save the engine basically and more than anything on number two spot for these cars having problems these engines is the fuel injectors which is quite a common one i change lots of injectors on these cars you can have your four like washer pipes coming off your injector leak off ports and you can have like three of them they're going do, 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 as the fuel comes out the pipe and then you'll have one where the fuel just comes out like a stream and it will fill your little bottle up in next to no time. And you just know that that's the faulty injector. I'm, I'm, and I've put your videos out for these anyway. I guess most of you have seen these fuel injector leak off tests done. And most times you'll fit a new one or two new injectors and your problem is solved. If that doesn't solve your problem, as in, well, we'll get to Frenchy in a minute, but... If your fuel injectors are all okay and your fuel filter is fine, then you need to start looking at your high pressure fuel pump. And I'm, I'm saying this, if you have low pressure fuel codes in your ECU. So you'd look at your high pressure fuel pump and 
well, when I, our number three spot tonight for these engines playing up is this is a spring inside the high pressure fuel pump. There's a spring that actually, when the, the cam low in the pump is turning round, it pushes this spring, which pumps the fuel through to your fuel rail. The springs can break. In some cases, they can break and they still pump the fuel, but it's not enough. So the car will go into limp mode when you put your foot down. In other cases, where the spring, the spring might break right in the center and it will stop pumping fuel altogether and your car will just die out and that'll be it. It'll break down. So anyway, that's that. I'll go through a few more comments and then uh, I'm gonna read you French's problem, his update actually. <clears throat> uh, hello, Paul. Damien, I'd regularly put in a bottle of 40 or a ca carbon clean. Ooh. Hello, Chris, mate. How are you? It's that time again. <laughs> Hope you're well um, on the old J. Yes. God damn, this stuff is good. <laughs> Say hello to Monica for me, I will. I will drop down again and see you in person. Well, thank you, Chris. I'll turn this pizza around, but he's gonna to have to come down and cut it himself. I ain't making the kids dinner tonight. It's my night off. Hello Mondo, when I worked in plant hire, a company was always a believer in oil fortifiers and machines did many hours without issue, but regular planned maintenance. Well, yeah, that's what, that's what it all comes down to at the end of the day, doesn't it? Maintenance. It's the same as weeding your garden. If you don't weed your garden, it's gonna get overgrown. If you don't, if you don't dust the surfaces in your living room, the dust will settle and eat its way into the surfaces in some severe cases. So it's everything is maintenance, really, isn't it? You, you've got to keep on top of everything. You can't let things slide too much. If you can't do it yourself, you've got to get some hired help in, haven't you? <laughs> Hello, Rob. It's winter time. Yes, it certainly is. Zero, zero Celsius. My Mondeo Mark V diesel needs 12 miles to get engine hot with grill shutter closed. Is this normal? My Mondeo Mark IV petrol needs one mile to be hot. Uh, I should think it should heat up a little bit quicker than that. <laughs> a, a bit quicker than 12 miles. I would be uh, I would be looking at your thermostat. I have had, in a number of cases, or you, even though you've got an electronic thermostat, the actual part that would have been your wax stat, it's still got a rubber seal on it to seal the water, stop the water from going through your top hose to the radiator. So, and I've had them seals rot away or come out of place and the water just flows past your thermostat into the radiator. So it's not cooling up, it's not heating up the engine first. The water is leaking past the thermostat into the radiator, and that way you're not gonna get the engine warm quick, are you? You've got to have that rain. And also you can start your car up from cold and run it for a little while. And obviously your heater pipes should get hot first, but if your top radiator hose coming off your thermostat starts getting warm very quickly, then you know that your thermostat stuff. I would check that first. Regular oil changes, that's right. That's if you can afford the oil. It's <laughs> zero 030, it's bloody expensive. Hello, Stevie. Is it a good idea to tune up or chip a 1.8 TDCI Mondeo Mark IV? Car is running great, but sometimes I wonder, could I? I've not actually heard of anyone 
you know, mapping, I guess what you call it, <laughs> 1.8. I mean, a two litre, yes, people do them. And from what I've heard, no problem. They're quite capable of it. So, uh, but not a 1.8, I've not heard of that. I can't really answer that. I think what you best do is, is have a word with the guys who do the remapping and, and see what they say. See if they've actually done a few. They may well have done. It's worth a phone call, then, then you'll know. Good evening. Haven't, I think your comments come out twice, Paul, for some reason. Well, it's this Sismix 221. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Hello, Alan, from Australia. Flipping heck. How's it going down under? What part of Australia are you from? Sydney, City of Brides. <laughs> I think Australia would be a fantastic country to visit, but it's so big, isn't it? It's massive. It's, it's like you you would you would need a few years just to get around a little bit of it. Anyway, thanks for dropping in, Alan. It's nice to see people who are from the other side of the planet are actually on this blooming live stream. Hello, Finn, over there in Ireland. How are you? I'm doing great. I hope you're good as well. It's more, I, I should think it is, isn't it? Yeah. You're uh, upside down to me. <laughs> totally, I should think. Over here, it's uh, half past eight in the evening. It's, I'll tell you what, that is quite a time difference. Hugo, hello. Portugal. Hello, friend from Portugal. For your work, I'm going to buy a Mondeo Vignali 2018, two litre, 180 horsepower. That's a top car, you know. It's got all the toys, all the bells and whistles. <laughs> You'll like that. They're very nice cars. Good evening to you, T4 Law. <laughs> I can't pronounce some of these names. T T4 T4 Law. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Liam, hello. You are top man like thank you very much, Liam. I've just tried to sort of like bullshit my way, you know. <laughs> I think once you uh once you talk to a camera enough, you kind of have that relationship with it where you can sort of like get on with it. Because no, when I first started talking to a camera, I sort of like stuttered too much. I wasn't very good at it. It's not like talking to another person. It's, it's a bit off-putting, you know, when you're looking down the... Well, you don't, you're not supposed to look at the flipping LCD. You've got to look down the eye of the camera and it's a bit like... <laughs> It's a bit difficult sometimes. It takes a bit of getting used to. A knickknack, hello. Buenas tardes, Senor Alan. Oh, thank you. What country are you from? It sounds a bit Spanish to me. Buen Buenos. I, I mean, that could that could be a lot of different countries, really, couldn't it? <laughs> Argentina. Mondo, is Moni still at gym on Wednesdays? Don't see her sidekick in turn. Has she left flying solo? I don't, who's her sidekick? I don't know. But she still goes, I know she still goes to the gym. I don't go to a gym. I don't need a gym. I'm fit enough, but it's like, <laughs> I don't need to lose any more weight. My flipping trousers are falling down all by themselves. But no, uh, Yes, she still goes to the gym. It's a bit like a cult for some people, isn't it? It's, it's like a, a social club, I guess. You could call it that.
Lindsay, hello. Good evening to you. Thomas, hello. Ever had much on the Mark V Mondeo oil pressure issues and the timing chains snapping? Thomas, all I can say is, where the hell have you been? <laughs> do you know? Do you know how many videos I put out, all the same about timing chains and the Mark V Mondeo? I don't have an oil pressure issue. Well, well, they do actually. When the, when the, uh, you're going to tell me something totally different here, but when the top plastic guide or the guides break off the. Uh, the, the actual tensioner, the chain tensioner, the oil kind of sprays everywhere, all over the place. And you, you can hear the brake vacuum pump become noisy on the other side of the cylinder head. And that says to me that the oil pressure is not getting across to the brake vacuum pump side properly. So you are losing oil pressure. And uh, yes, I have plenty of broken timing chains and worn out tensioners. And I've, I've changed no end of these timing chains. One minute, one minute. I've got to sort out the kids' pizza at the same time. But yes, uh, if you look at my channel, I've, I've put out quite a lot about these timing chains. The problem is no matter what you say, when you're dealing, I'm not dealing with one or two cars. When you're dealing with like a hundred taxis that are constantly on the road, it's all about how much you can spend on them compared to how, how long you can spend on them to fix them. And uh, it, it's very expensive to keep a hundred taxis on the road. I mean, you're talking 25 to 30,000 pound a month in Ford parts alone. That's forgetting everything else. And uh, <laughs> It's like I could, I could turn around and say, well, we could, we could change the oil at 10,000 miles rather than 15,000 miles. But someone's got to do the work. And, you know, with that amount of cars, it's, uh, it's difficult. I've got to chop the pizza up. But yeah, I will get back to these chains very shortly tonight, snapping and God knows what, because it's it's a quite it's a common problem. In fact, I changed I changed the chain this week. Monday afternoon I started the chain and finished it Tuesday morning. That hadn't snapped. It was noisy as hell, and the the, the little nylon guide had completely gone off the top of the tensioner. The bottom guide was okay. But even though the, the top guide was gone, it was enough for the chain to be very noisy. But there's a particular mileage I'm kind of finding these chains are playing up at. You've got to cut the pieces like they're doing dominoes. Thank you. Reference add blue. My friend has the same 1.5 HDI as us and uses twice as much add blue as us, but we wait until the fuel tank is empty and then brim it when he adds fivers or tenors as and when. So you probably notice these things. Do you top the tank up, keep it topped up, or do you just put a fiver or a tenor in it? Does it affect how much add blue you put in it? I don't know. I don't, I don't really drive the cars to find out these answers, but 
<laughs> I really, I'm going to move on. This is out of my depth. <laughs> I just drive a car backwards and forwards to work, and that's about it. So I wouldn't really, really know whether it makes any difference. <clears throat> Hello, Mark. That's how I do with the oven. Yeah. I worked that one out. It wasn't too much to work out, by the way, but it's like you get a good bit of heat come out of there. So you're like, now, now, the, now the pizza's come out of the oven. I'll leave the oven door. I'll, actually, I'm not going to list. I'm going to shut it because I'll tell you something. I've got the central heating on and it's like, <laughs> it's flipping warm in here. Oh, it's like cooking. I might have to open the door and let the zero degrees temperatures come in. I'm going to faint. Hello, Johnny. How do you pr prevent engine over speed on downhills? <clears throat> engine over speed on downhills. I'm not quite with you. When you're going downhill, just leave it in gear. In a higher gear. Tony, hello, how are you? Hello, Matty. I used to do that with the oven until I forgot it was open and smashed my leg into the... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, wherever there's a, an action, there's always going to be a reaction. So uh, it's, a, it's one of these little hazards. There's always a trade-off, isn't there? And walking into the oven door <laughs> is the little hazard you might have to face. The things we have to do to keep warm. Alexander, hello. Greetings from Bulgaria. Flipping heck. Hello over there in Bulgaria. I love your videos. Have helped me out a lot with my Mark 5 2 litre 2 DCI and save me a bunch of money. Well, that's what it's all about. If you can learn a little bit, I mean, I guess a lot of you, you have you, you buy one of these cars, and it's kind of like, you kind of cringe if you have to, unless you've got lots of money to burn, you kind of don't want to take it to the main dealer all the time, or to garages and sort of like over stupid stuff maybe. And if you can learn a bit about your car and understand it a bit better, it will help you if anything goes wrong. It might be something... Simple, and you can say, aha, I can fix that by the side of the road. I can change my headlight bulb in the pub car park, maybe. <laughs> uh, Mohammed, hello. Mohammed Ali flies like, a <laughs> flies like a butterfly and stings like a bee. <laughs> How are you doing, Mr. Noise Mechanic? <laughs> Just wondering, 2017 soot accumulation bank one, what might be? If the turbo a bit leaking oil might be the problem and oil rises too. No, the, the soot accumulation, I shouldn't think that's the turbo unless there's a problem with the turbo. Soot accumulations in your diesel particulate filter. And... Uh, I take it that's a Mark V Mondeo, two litre diesel. If you're getting soot accumulation, there could be a number of reasons for that. From a faulty EGR valve is one of them. And also, I'll tell you what I have been getting. I might as well bring this up now because I was talking about faults that go wrong with the, the Mondeos that can cause them to go into limp mode. And your DPF, diesel particulate filter, getting blocked up with soot is certainly one of the things that can cause your car to go into limp mode. I have found most times it's either a faulty EGR valve or on top of your EGR, there is like a little, there's a bunch of vacuum pipes down there. 
you can have one of them vacuum pipes that is not fixed onto its connector. That's quite a, that one can happen. Or bolted to the side of your fuel filter bowl, there is a, a, a turbo boost control solenoid. That solenoid can go weak or stop working. But I think, but there's not just one solenoid there, there's two. There's one further down behind the fuel filter bowl, hard to see. And if you have to change your turbo boost control solenoids, and this is why you have to plug a diagnostic tool into your car to read the ECU codes, because if it can be come up with turbo boost control, blah, 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 or something to them lines, you can pretty much say it's that solenoid or the little solenoid that it's attached to. And it all, if you have to buy that solenoid, I'm pretty sure from Ford, they sell it with all the vacuum pipes on it. Yeah. So you have to change the whole vacuum pipe assembly, which is all straightforward, but you have these two solenoids and a whole bunch of vacuum pipes that you have to connect up. I have done quite a few now. When them solenoids play up, they will cause your turbo not to work properly and they will cause your DPF to get blocked with soot. And then you'll get your engine what's called into forced limited power eventually where it's the soot accumulation has risen to a level in your DPF that's so high that the ECU is saying it won't allow your car to be driven or the turbo to work at all anymore. So <clears throat> in that situation, you have to sort of like rectify the problem or find out what's caused the soot accumulation. Then you have to do a static regeneration on your diesel particulate filter, which means having your scanner cause your engine to rev up at about two and a half thousand RPM. But it's, it's not when you're doing a regeneration to clear the soot out of the DPF, it's not just holding the revs up. The ECU is altering the fueling going through the injectors. So you'll probably notice if you ever witness the regen being done, the engine will change note every now and again because it's trying to force, you know, the, the soot to be burnt out. So it's, it's altering the, the fuel and it goes through the injectors in order to do that. It's all kind of clever stuff, really, out of your uh, electronic brain in your car. Anyway, let me move on a little bit. I am still trying banging my brain from last week. Onions. <laughs> stream to find out what orange rusty red my 1985 mark one paint color was called <laughs> i'm sure <clears throat> if you uh you'll be able to find out the color code or what colors were available it must be out there somewhere <clears throat> someone someone will know Hello, Keith. Have a 2018 1.5 TDCI transit courier. Keeps going into engine service now. Reduce power mode. Brings up random fault codes when it happens. Fraud main stealers and no garage can find any fault. Well, it, if it goes into limp mode and reduce power mode, there has to be a code in the ECU. There just has to be. Well, I'll, I'll get, I'll get this. <laughs> there could be a, a total freak, and there isn't, but in, in nine times out of 10, there'll be a code. And that code, you'll have to go. So I know what you mean by you can get random codes. It's the same on the Mondeos. You can have one particular thing go wrong, and it can cause like a cataclysm of other codes to come up, which are kind of random and have nothing to do with, with actually solving the problem. But if you've got someone experienced who knows what they're looking at, they will know what code is the one that needs to be looked at, the one that's going to cure your problem. And the other three or four codes are just subsidiaries of, of the main code, and that you just ignore them. And once you've rectified the main problem, then all them other little codes won't, won't come back again anyway. So... Uh, it's, it's finding people who actually know these vehicles and know what's wrong with them. Some people can, you know, on your particular vehicle would, would say, ah, 
But that's what it is. Just, you know, without hesitation. But it's finding them people. There are people out there who can do that, who will know this. It's difficult. That's why I, I always say it's important whenever you get a problem is to put it on the internet. Either you put it in a forum somewhere, write it down, and or put it as a video or something. Because whenever we want to find something, it's nice to go on the internet and find an answer. Unfortunately, a lot of these forums, people put their problems down and other people try to help. And by the time you get to the end of the forum, there's no answer. And very rarely, someone will come up who will put their original problem down and they'll, they'll come back and they'll say, after their car's fixed, they'll come back to that forum and they'll put the answer down of how well, what, what rectified it. And then you come along with the same bloody problem and it's nice to actually have an answer there because so many times there isn't an answer and it's frustrating. My 2-litre TDCI Mark V is only averaging 40 miles per gallon on a 300-mile motorway run. Was having P2000 code, but two NOx sensors cured it, keeping it requiring oil changes every 6K miles on my dash. I originally heard <coughs> that... The P2000, I mean, I've had this P2000. In some cases, you can change the knock sensors and you won't see that code again. In other cases, it still comes back. And I heard originally from Ford it was a software problem. So I'm wondering, <clears throat> it's the kind of code that doesn't really cause a problem with your engine. It might be worth going, getting having a word with Ford service and seeing if there's an update on your car, a software update, because that may well cure it. No other fault codes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a random code. I mean, I've had that code no, no, loads of times. I've, I've sometimes changed the sensors, fine, but other times you'll clear the code and you won't see it again for months on end. And there was someone from Ford who told me a couple of years back, it, it, was, a, it was a bloody, uh, it was a software issue and it was something they're looking into. So it might be one of them that's gonna be a bit of a problem. Uh, Steve, seriously, have you seen a Ford Von Ass yet? I'm damn sure it's a Mondeo Mark VI. Only Mark IV Jr. is still alive. <laughs> well, you can't you can't keep a good Jonah down, can you? No, I've not seen one. No. But if it's built by the Chinese, I, I really don't want to know. <laughs> it's like... I've seen what the, I've seen what the Chinese have done with the MGs, the Morris Garages badge, and I think I, I think that's terrible. I can't, you know, Morris Garages MG, that's what it stood for. It's like, and they've they've they're shit all over it. Why keep why you know it's Brit? It was a British brand. Why not let it, you know, go and die somewhere? That's what happened to it. They went out of business. Why, why do the Chinese have to take, take the name by the bloody name and try and rebrand it and, uh, as MG? It's not Morris Garages anymore. It's somewhere in China they're making them. So why can't they just make their own bloody cars? Just worked on my first Mark V Mondeo 2 day diesel, come in for a full service, not bad cars to work on. They're not too bad until they get real high mileage on them. Then you'll start swearing a little bit. In actual fact, at this point, I'm going to go over now and I'm going to talk about this 
French's car because I'll just recap quickly. Going back to last June, he messaged me. He had a problem where his car was occasionally going into reduced power mode. And I put out a video explaining the checking procedure, how he's got to go to check for the fault. So, <clears throat> which basically was, was a case of check if ECU codes, check your fuel filter, do a fuel injector leak off chest test, check your high pressure fuel pump spring isn't broken. <clears throat> and also check when you're checking your fuel filter, make sure there's no metal particles in your fuel filter, like lots and lots of glitter. <clears throat> a few little bits of glittery uh, stuff in your fuel filter bowl isn't a sign that you've got a problem. But if there's a lot of it in there, then you definitely have. <clears throat> but Frenchy has messaged me and he's given me a response now, sort of like eight months later. So we'll see how his car's got up. He's put update. I have finally brought the car to DTM, a Bosch specialist. He's then put edit. DTM called. I'm sure his, his first bit before the edit was they told him that his injectors were leaking off too much fuel, in which case he'd need a couple of injectors, which would be perfect because that, that would answer the question of why his car is going into limp mode occasionally. When it, basically, when he's putting his foot down, obviously, the, the too much fuel leaking off the injectors. So a couple of the injectors need replacing. But he's put, DTM called this morning stating that the fuel pump and the whole fuel system needs replacing and fuel tank needs cleaning. £2,800 for the job. They said the high pressure fuel pump is breaking up, causing metal filings to go around the fuel system. And this has damaged the injector return control within the injectors. Right. Now, what I find a little bit strange about this is, and I've got a story here, because I've had a similar situation, and it, it yeah, well, I'll get to it. <clears throat> when French's car was originally going into limp mode, that probably was a fuel injector leaking off too much fuel. But it's only taken him now, eight months later, to take it to a garage to get it looked at. If your high pressure fuel pump on your Mark V Mondeo two litre diesel starts putting metal filings into your fuel system. And the way it does that is there's a cam lobe inside your pump. And as that cam lobe, cam lobe spins, spins around, it's hitting like another lobe, which pushes your spring, the spring that breaks. And this spring that's being compressed like that as the cam lobe goes round, uh, it wears the cam lobe. And you can get a little chip off your cam lobe. The little, like the case hardening, the chrome bit, the, whatever you call it, chips off. And then as that cam lobe is spinning, you're getting tiny, tiny little bits of metal filings coming off that cam lobe and going into your fuel. <coughs> now, in a lot of cases, I've had this a number of times, the actual metal particles will come out of your high pressure fuel pump and sure, they will go around your entire fuel system, into the fuel tank and everywhere. But they will also come out of your high pressure fuel pump through your high pressure pipe into your fuel rail and go straight into your diesel injectors. Because you've got metal particles in your fuel system, doesn't put your car into limp mode when you put your foot down, not straight away. What you would get was the, the metal particles would go into your injectors and you would start getting a misfire. So you would probably have one cylinder drop off first, start misfiring, and your engine would start running on three cylinders. Then you would definitely know you've got a big problem. And I've had this case, this scenario, a number of times now. And the reason that these, this garage is saying they need to take the fuel tank out and clean it all out, they need to replace the entire fuel system, which they're basically saying to replace the high pressure fuel pump, obviously, replace all the injectors, maybe, and uh, probably replace all your fuel pipes. 
a main dealer would replace everything, probably a lot more money than what they're charging there, to cover themselves because they don't want no metal particles in the entire fuel system whatsoever. So they would replace the entire fuel system so that there'd be no repercussions later on down the road. But whenever I have done uh, one of these situations where I've had metal going into the high pressure fuel system, I've had to replace the high pressure fuel pump. If it's just one or two injectors that are misfiring, it's normally one injector, I would replace that injector and the other three injectors are probably still working fine. I tend to find the metal particles seem to go into one injector more than the other. And then you would take your pipes all off underneath your bonnet, all your fuel pipes off, and you would clean them all out. You can put brake cleaner through and blow them all out of a high pressure airline, clean out your fuel rail and everything. You can, you can literally blow down your, your fuel pipes down the car, and it's up to you whether you want to take a fuel tank out or clean it or not. The way I see it, in a lot of cases, the fuel that comes from the tank will come round to the fuel filter and will get stopped at the filter anyway. As long as you've cleaned all the pipes, fuel rail, and everything under your bonnet as, as far as fuel flowing through it. So you can get away with it without spending a, a, an absolute fortune. And I've done it a number of times and the cars have been absolutely fine. As long as you can catch it early enough. I've, I've had cars in the past though, that have put an absolute massive amount of metal particles but into the fuel system. But as far as the Mark 5 Mondeos go, they don't put huge amounts of metal particles in the fuel system. It's not excessive like some do. So, uh, But this, this doesn't make sense to me because French's original problem was his car was going to limp mode. And when you get metal particles going into your fuel system, it doesn't put your car into limp mode it will cause an engine misfire, if anything, to start with. So I find it a little bit, I, I'm kind of thinking to myself that possibly he's got one or two injectors which are leaking off too much, and they've seen something in the fuel, and they think, oh, that sounds a bit suspicious. Maybe we should just change everything. And here's the, here's the thing that I had. Hang on, I'm just going to get another drink. We had a car that I took to a garage, a dealer. It was a Mark V Mondeo and it wouldn't run. And we took it to the main dealer to hopefully that they would find the problem. And I'd already been looking at the car and I'd, had, I'd already had the fuel tank out and all the fuel pipes off looking for metal in the tank and everything like that. And there wasn't anything. I'd be, well, I, I, I changed the pump in the tank. I thought that could have been a problem. But this dealer, they come back to me and they said, uh, yeah, there's contamination in your fuel. So we need to replace the entire fuel system. And I thought contamination in the fuel, no there isn't. So I, when we got the car back, I took the fuel filter top off and I looked in the fuel filter bowl and there, there, to be honest, there was something, there was little dots of something floating in the fuel. But I say floating in the fuel, you know, like a bit of, bits of oil or something like that. Bits of, it, wasn't, it wasn't even oil, it was, I don't know, it was just bits of dirt or something. It was floating. As you know, metal doesn't float. So it definitely wasn't metal. And this, this was the car that turned out to be an ECU fault in the end. I got a second-hand ECU off eBay, got it reprogrammed to the car, and away it went, boom, it was fine. And there was nothing wrong in the fuel system. So if I'd have gone down the route of three and a half thousand pound to replace the entire fuel system, it would have been all for nothing. So that, that was some wrong diagnosis. They just saw a few dots, spots of something in the fuel system and said, no, we don't want to know. You either pay three and a half grand and replace your entire fuel system or we're walking away from the job. So, what can I say? You can't trust the diagnosis of everyone. Sometimes, even if it's a main dealer, you, you can't always go by what they say. They're not always right. Uh, 
Johnny, hello. I hope you can explain it how to not overspeed engines. <laughs> the only way you're not going to overspeed an engine is to put it in a higher gear. If you're going down a hill and you're in a very low gear, your revs are going to go up. If you're in a higher gear, you're obviously going to go down the hill faster, but the revs aren't going to be as high. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. Put your foot on the brake. <laughs> Hello, Mick. How are you? Hello, Mark. Where is the solenoid on the engine? The, the solenoid. <laughs> You mean your oil pressure control solenoid. It's If you know where your oil filter is, it's just above your oil filter. On the left-hand side, you've got your oil pressure switch, and on the right-hand side, you've got your oil pressure control solenoid. The control solenoid is, is like a long, tubular solenoid, and an oil pressure switch just looks like a normal oil pressure switch. So it's, it's, it's all on your oil filter housing assembly. You can't miss it. It's just above your oil filter. Hello, Ian. How are you? I want my second whiskey. It is now one over one hour we've been running for. I didn't want to keep it too long tonight, but we'll we'll soldier on for a little while. Suge, Serge, Suge. Hello. How's it going, mate? I'm a Scania. Oh, that sounds technical. Lorries. I should think that's very interesting. Well, very technical indeed. I know uh, these modern combine harvesters and things like that can be, <laughs> can be super bloody technical. I've never had to work on lorries though. I have, however, which you might find quite funny, worked on a few buses. Toyota Caetano. Merck 709s, Leyland Swift, Iveco. In, in fact, there's, there's an Iveco, I think it was a 31-seat bus. You probably know this, you may know this, if you know a little bit about buses. It, it failed its MOT test up in Peterborough at the HGV testing centre. On the uh, passenger front, a uh, torsion bar goes from your top suspension arm at your passenger front. This torsion bar goes along to the body, but where it goes through the top suspension arm, the bushes have worn out. And I heard all these horror stories that these torsion bars don't come out. They seize up in the, in the suspension arm. And I thought, I've got to change these bushes. How the flipping heck am I going to do this? So I loosened the torsion bar at the bolt, the adjusting bolt at down the, halfway down the bus. And then at the suspension arm part, there was a bit you, you loosen off before you can actually get to the torsion bar. You've got to knock the torsion bar out of the arm. And I got my hammer and my drift and I hit it once and it moved. And I was just I just like sat there in sort of like this bloody belief, like, holy shit. <laughs> I can't believe my luck because I was expecting to take the whole suspension off and having to cut it all off and everything. But no, it just come out. I was like, I was really happy that day. <laughs> Something had gone right. But yeah, I, I've never had to work on Norris, but yeah, I should think it's, uh, well, I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't have the first idea what to, <laughs> what to look at. But anyway, hello. Good evening, Anna. Hope you are well. Listen, listening while driving my lorry at work. Whoa. <laughs> You know, I went, you know, about the, the only time I, I have been in a lorry before. I can't remember what the bloody name of it. It was a Renault Magnum. That's what it, it was, a Renault Magnum. Huge, great, big, bloody lorry. My next door neighbour at the time, and I'm going back to 1995. He had a, he would done international lorry driving, and I went with him, and we went from... Uh, England to Italy through Luxembourg and all that and I went with him in the lorry and it was fantastic loved it 
you were sitting really high up. It was great. So uh, yeah, that's about my only experience of a lorry. Right, one minute. Okay, no worries. Hara, question for a C3. I have seen on the first generation C3 facelift that the interior is was changed like on the Mondeo first generation. So my opinion, it is the Mark II, but the PSA didn't publish for. Mm. I don't really, uh, yeah, I kind of, I get where you're coming from. All I can say is, does it matter? Call it what you like. As long as it looks nice and the missus is happy with it. <laughs> Do you know other cars, second generation, that have been called Mark III? No, no, I don't. The only one that I, I do know about is the, is the Mondeo. The Mark II is still the Mark I, basically. But we all call it the Mark II. So. <clears throat> Alan, I have a 2014 2-litre two HDI. It is losing coolant from somewhere at the top of the top of the engine at the back. Can't see it from the top. 2-litre HDI. So it's down, losing it from down the back where the turbo is. There's a limited room down there. You're really going to have to get it on a ramp then. See if you can get it on someone's ramp or get it up, driven up onto some ramps or something so you can get underneath it and have a look. You could get, you know, there's a few hoses down there and uh, especially around the, around the side of the cylinder head where they go down the back. You can have, and trouble is a lot of these coolant hoses these days, they have metal pipes and they push into, or like your housings, they'll push into a metal pipe and have an O-ring there. And the O-rings deteriorate and then you start getting drips of water. So you're really going to have to sort of like investigate or get someone to get underneath it and have a good look. Oh, Bob. My experience of the 1.5 diesel used in Fords from about 2015 that replaced the 1.6 PSA unit. They look pretty similar, but wonder what's different. Yeah, I, I don't really know much about the 1.5s. I don't know why they, they've done a 1.5 and a 1.6. It's <laughs> All I know is the 1.5s weren't a very good engine. I think they've done a, they were prone to head gaskets. But it's like all the two litres. I, I mentioned this the other day. The two litre, the, the one that I'm talking about, they have so many engine codes. And it's like, why do they have all these codes? And I think a lot of it is to do with the ECUs. It's, a, it's different software in the ECUs. Yet it's the same engine. So it, it, <laughs> it's mind boggling. Agree maintenance, yes, it is definitely. Agree, it's the thermostat. Very well, it's, it's the most logical thing to go for, really. Daniel, what grade oil do you use? I have Peugeot 308 180. <coughs> well, we use 030. It's, it's zero thirty oil. They call it piss water, but it's bloody expensive, and it's all to do with the low ash for the DPF. That's why they. That's one of the reasons they're using it. It's low ash oil, <clears throat> so it's not liable to cause DPF issues. And as we've found over the years, it's probably best to use the proper uh, 
oil for whatever engine you've got. If you use the wrong oil, it, you can run into problems. That's if you intend to keep the car for any length of time. Alan, what's your highest mileage Mark V? I haven't been looking, you know, lately, but there is one around about 400,000. And I don't think that's had an engine changed. But as quite a few of them now, they've had engines changed. And as they will come back to now, what causes your engine to go into limp mode or this, that, and the other. <clears throat> We've gone down the lines of your oil pressure control solenoid, which I'll say is the most likely, then your fuel injectors, then obviously you've got your spring in your high pressure fuel pump, and then you can have the actual, I will go down the, the, the actual fuel pumps where they, the lobe gets chipped a little bit and it puts metal filings into your fuel system. <clears throat> On the Mark V, I've had it happen a number of times, but I wouldn't say it's common, although it does happen. It's not really that common a problem. Your EGR valve on your Mark V Mondeo is more likely to be more of a problem than getting metal particles into your fuel. And generally speaking, the EGR valves would just leak water. The casings and that plastic Bakelite casing will crack and it will, they will leak water. But I do have quite a few that will go wrong electrically and they can put your car into reduced power mode, or they can even block your DPF up. So uh, the EGR valve is high on the list of problems. But I will, at this point, touch on the timing chains again, because someone mentioned it earlier. I tend to find that when the car gets to probably 200,000 miles, usually 230, 240 onwards, your timing chain will start to get noisy. Now, I'm, I'm going on the assumption that I'm, we're doing oil changes every uh, roughly 15,000 miles, whereas your car, you might be doing oil changes every eight to 10,000 miles. That might make a difference. But here's the thing. On all the Mark V Mondeo taxis that we do oil changes on, we're getting a lot of these tensioners. It's this the little plastic guides on the chain tensioner that are breaking up, and then the chain gets flappy and starts rattling around, and then it starts scraping on the metal surface of the tensioner. And if it's left rattling, it'll eventually get snagged and break. When the chains break, they don't tend to do a hell of a lot of damage. So you can just put another chain and tension in it and normally get away with it. You may have one broken valve rocker if you're unlucky. But before we had the Mark V Mondeos, we had a whole fleet of Mark IV Mondeos, two litre diesels. And we were changing the oil on them around about every 12,000 miles. And I've never had to change the chain, not once, not even once. So it says to me, the Mark IV Mondeo, two litre diesel, Although it's a similar engine, it's not the same engine, and it's not the same. The chain might be, well, the chain's a chain, but it, it's, it's a different tensioner, that's all I can say. Because never once have I had the nylon guides of one of them engines break up and cause the chain to be that late. Unless you've been very unlucky, or very lucky, I don't know. But on the Mark Fives, even looking at the brand new tensioners, the little nylon guide the chain runs on, it just looks shitty. It doesn't look very strong. It just looks like a cheap piece of plastic that doesn't, not going to last very long. So that is becoming a common problem now. Uh, my John, hello. I have a 2010 Ford Focus 1.6 TDCI that smokes badly from exhaust. I've checked all the regular stuff, but everything is pointing to electrical issues. Do you know how much ECUs and BCMs? Well, you can't, you can't just go for the ECU. Generally, if it's an ECU issue, it would cause it just to conk out, if anything. 
or maybe it would be sending a signal to the injectors or I don't think it would just just generally cause it to smoke so if it's if it's smoking a lot then there could be something else wrong with it down the line so <laughs> the trouble is with these diesels it doesn't take much to make one of these engines smoke so I, I would personally put the, the scanner on it and check for any codes first. So it, it's going to need a bit of investigating. Even, even something like a split in one of your turbo boost hoses that might not even be that big, it might even be a small little hole or something, can cause your exhaust to get sooted up and cause a lot of smoke. So... It would need a, like a diesel technician to actually look at it properly first. I had an ex-police 1.8 TDCI that was chipped very quick and getting mid 50 miles per gallon. Now I've got a unchipped one. It's slower and only getting at mid 40s. Yeah. It's just not the engine that... Uh, you, you kind of hear of that gets chipped. But it, like I said, ring, ring up the map guy, see what he says. They might have done a few and they, they'll probably know what kind of performance you're going to get out of it and the miles per gallon because they have all that kind of information, don't they? It's worth, it's worth a phone call. Hello, Stephen. My Mondeo Mark III petrol failed MOT on emissions. I cleaned injectors on bench plus map and oxygen sensor. Still failed, done 50K. Any ideas on what else? Mark III petrol failed MOT on emissions. Well, if it failed on the emissions, you, you have to read the emission sheet to see how it failed. You've got your CO, your hydrocarbons, and your lamber. And your lamber wants to be around about 1.0. Uh, your hydrocarbons need to be below 200 parts per million. And your CO beneath needs to be below 0 0.20. So you have to read what it says on the sheet. If your lamber is miles out, then you could well be looking at an airflow meter problem or a lamber sensor problem, a HEGO sensor problem. So, but cleaning your injectors on a Mark III, I've not heard of injector problems on Mark III's. So it could just be the fact that your cat catalytic converters dead which is an uncommon thing on them cars. So, you, so for instance, your Lamber could be reading about right. Uh, it might just be the fact that your CO is, is, is over half a percent or more, and it just won't come down enough, and everything else is in, is in limits, so which means your cat's just dead. It just needs a new catalytic converter. But, yeah. You'd have to sort of like the sheet the MOT centre give you of the emission failure. The information that's on that sheet will kind of point you to what the answer is going to be. <clears throat> Watch the pizza. <laughs> Eight thirty-four. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up shortly because uh, time. I only wanted to keep this one as a short one. I might do a longer one next week. Shall we recreate the video that that have you been posted for a Mark Mondeo Mark III generations for about four years ago? You forgot to say about the fourth generation Mark V that has been released after Mark IV. <laughs> Who cares, is all I say. Who cares if it's a Mark III or a Mark IV? It is what it is. It's just a car. Sometimes the, the, the car manufacturers brand a car 
they'll call it the Mark One, and everybody will call it something different, and it just kind of sticks. So <laughs> some people don't don't care about whether it's a Mark Two or a Mark Three. And you predicted for a Mark V, great, it lasted for seven years, and then the Mark VI, fifth generation, has been released, unfortunately, on China. Well, it, it was obvious that China was going to have the last laugh, wasn't it? Xi Jinping, he seems to like picking at the bones of a dead animal, doesn't he? <laughs> they, 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 bought, they bought bloody British Leyland, didn't they? I don't know how they could do it. I mean, to be honest with you, the cars don't look half bad, some of them, but I wouldn't want to drive one. It's, it's not the fact that even if they were built well, which I doubt very much because they're Chinese, it's cheap and nasty. It's, it's, it's the fact, it's the principle of the fact that MG, I'm going back to MG now, because MG stood for Morris Gouges, and Morris Gouges was British. It died a death, it is over and finished with, and it should have been left buried. I don't know why they're trying to revamp it with an MG badge, because it's not Morris Garages no more. They should call it Xi Jinping Garages or China Garages. They bought the company, they could have renamed it. They're, they're trying to sort of like make money off the, off the heritage of Morris Garages. How do you remove the window controls on Mark IV Mondeo driver's side? How do you remove the window controls? I'm sure you just put a little, you've got to get a, uh, a trim tool and carefully put it down the side and they, they flick out and clip out. You've got to be careful though. You need a thin trim tool just to slide down the side of them controls then buttons, you mean the switch pack, down the back bit of the switch pack, and then you can flick it out. There's a little spring clip. Just got to be careful you don't break nothing. Hello, Chris. Why does pressure bleeding brakes over 20 PSI or so knock out the ESP, ASC, etc.? The ABS still works, but the stability doesn't. And the traction control only works off the throttle. I don't know. I don't use a pressure bleeder. I've, I've never used one. All the brakes I've bled, I've either done it uh, with a bottle and a pipe, or I've done it with the scanner through the ABS, and, and the scanner makes the ABS pump push the fluid through. So, but I've never used a pressure bleeder. So I, I don't know that one. Power, power, hello. Hello, hi from Estonia. Oh my God, well, hello. <laughs> How's it going over there? Hello, Barry. Would you know what causes the engine on a Fiesta 1.25 litre to rev up and down up to 4,000 revs all on its own? Ooh. <laughs> well, you're going to have to get that plugged in and check for ECU codes once again. But uh, I should think the worst is, is pro it could well be something to do with the throttle pedal, something like that, faulty throttle pedal. Or worst case scenario, your turbo is about to take a shit and it's going to run on its own engine oil, in which case it will take off by itself. So it might be worth getting your the pipe pulled off your turbo and get someone to check your turbo impeller that, that you get hold of it. You can get hold of it, maybe with a long pair of pliers or maybe your fingers if you can get them in there and jiggle the impeller. And if there's a lot of play in it, then you need to change the turbo. If there's no, there shouldn't be any play in it at all, really. Not like, like that. There shouldn't be nothing. Some turbos you can get and if they're worn out, they'll go side to side like that or you can jiggle them up and down. So uh, 
when the bearings get worn out in your turbo, the oil can spew past the bearings into your inlet or down the exhaust and they, they can get round into your engine and the engine oil will like, literally go into your cylinders and your car will run on its own engine oil. So, uh, but I should think if it's only four thousand, normally when that happens, it's they rev up uncontrollably. I should think if it's only doing four thousand RPM, it sounds like something electrical. So it could be a faulty throttle pedal. But you'd have to get your car plugged into a diagnostic tool to see if there's any codes. First of all, to sort of like point you in the right direction. What do you think about Mark III Mondeo petrol failing emissions? Well, most of the time, it's either a Lambda sensor or the catalytic converter's dead. Because if it's a petrol, it's probably a two litre, uh, what do they call them? It's a two litre petrol engine, Duratec, two litre Duratec petrol engine. The catalytic converters on them cars, they're not the best of things. So, uh, Normally, when they get to around about 150,000 miles, the cat could well be dead. So, in, in my experience, it's either, generally speaking, it's the number two Lambda sensors, the one that goes faulty, and or the cat. It's just worn out. It needs a new cat. And normally, they smell anyway. You can, you can smell them. They smell a bit funny. Leaper Gaming. Galaxy Duratalk shudders taking off. <sighs> Badly worn flywheel. <laughs> Who? You had my you you had any Mark V two liter that refused to start after being turned off. No fault codes. Live data all looks good has got fuel pressure, restarts after leaving 30 minutes or so. No, I think we did. Maybe it's going back some years now. We had a car that it was, wouldn't, wouldn't, you'd crank over and wouldn't start. And if you left it, all of a sudden it'd just start again. I don't know what happened to that. I really don't know what happened to that car. It, I think it just righted itself. But no, I've not had that scenario, not in a number of years now. Whenever a car hasn't started, it's, there's been a definite reason for it. So no, I'm not sure. If anything comes up along them lines, I will, uh, I will let you know. How's the drone flying going? It's not. The drone sits up in the bloody cupboard and hasn't been used in ages. But I intend to use it soon, very soon in April. I'm going somewhere, so I will be using it. And I will be posting. Alan, you had any Mark V 2 litre intermittently refused to start when turned off? Uh, I've been through this one. No, but I should think there's a perfectly logical explanation. I'll tell you one thing that does come to mind, which might seem a bit strange. You know, I'm banging on about the high pressure fuel pump and the springs that can break in them pumps. And uh, sometimes the spring will break in a certain position where it still pumps the fuel a bit and the car will carry on running. So I've had a few of them where they've been very hard to start, them cars, and it's because of the spring in the pump's broken. So it either won't start, and then later on when it gets cold, it will start. The fuel's a bit fit, a bit thicker when it's colder, isn't it? So uh, it's just something to think about. If there's no codes in the ECU, which, you know, normally if there's a problem, that there will be a code flung up. So it could just be something mechanical. D O C Savage one. Hello. Should the taxi drivers be advised to watch your videos so they'll know 
as soon as they hear a sudden strange noise, for example, pull over before catastrophe. No, they're not going to give a shit. Who cares? Because it's like they're not. <laughs> they're, they're they're just out there making money. So I don't, I, some of them are pretty good though. Some of them will anything they hear, they'll be down and they're saying there's a noise. There's this. There's that. Others just don't care. They'll just keep on driving. It's not their car, so why should they care? Some do, some don't. It's the way the world works, isn't it? If a car takes a dump, they'll just get out of it and ask for another car, won't they? Not their problem. Bill, I bet the colour was carnival red. I wish I knew what the colours were, but I don't. It was, it was a long time ago. Sunburst or Rosso red. They're more modern. Well, I call them modern colours, but they're not really modern, are they? They've been out a long time, them, them two reds. Hi, how are you doing? I just wanted... To ask, are plastic trim removal tools okay or do they need to be metal? And also, would you like SUVs to disappear? They are just so boring. I'm not really keen on SUVs. Uh, a plastic trim tool, if you're doing things like taking door cards off and stuff like that, would be handy. I prefer a metal one myself because the metal ones are nice and stronger. I always use a metal one. So uh, but sometimes on these pieces of trim, you need a thin blade to, <laughs> to get down some of these bits to, to release them because there's, there's, there's not enough of a gap there to get a trim tool in there. So uh, but as in the case of removing the switch pack from a March, Mark IV door panel, you can use a metal one. As long as you get the metal in the right place, you won't do no damage. But there'd be no more video uploads, I suppose. <laughs> Hello, Gary. How are you? Thank you. Mark III Petrol Mondeo failed emissions, done injectors. Now that we've been through that, an oxygen sensor still, still failed. It probably is a lot. It may well be a sen oxygen sensor. But you may well end up with a new cat as well. Is genuine Ford parts better than aftermarket? Do you use motor parts direct as well? Yeah, we do use motor parts direct. Uh, they're pretty good. Uh, genuine Ford parts, I would say they definitely are better than aftermarket parts and when you talk about luk clutches the clutches you'll buy from ford which are luk they're not the same clutches you buy in luk boxes from aftermarket motor factors there's different there's different qualities of them they look exactly the same but they're not the same quality and they're different prices so uh, you've got to beware. I've already been down this route with the guy from Ford. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's a flipping minefield out there. You think you're buying something which is equivalent to the main dealer and it's not. So just beware what you're buying. Sometimes, sometimes it's perfectly fine to get parts and motor facts. And most of the time we do. But a lot of the time... If you want something to that you know is going to work and be right, you take diesel fuel injectors, for example, for these Mondeos. I will only buy them from either Ford or Euro car parts sell genuine Ford ones, although they sell them cheaper than Ford sell them for. So that's what you've got to try and work out. And they sell genuine injectors. I will only buy genuine injectors for these cars. I won't bother going for remanufactured ones. I've had too many remanufactured injectors from motor factors that just cause nothing but more problems on top of the problems you've already got. And if I get the genuine ones from Ford, nearly all the time they just work. 
So for the extra money, I've got less of a headache. That's the way I see it. They have written for a Mondeo second generation on the internet. That is the Mark II, but that did your say actually it's optional. I call it the second generation. Hara, you're getting too deep. You're far too deep with this <laughs> Mondeo generations. <laughs> it's it's too far back in history now. <laughs> Nobody cares anymore. The Mark One and Mark Two have all gone. They all rusted away. Nobody cares anymore. They have written for a Mondeo second generation on the internet. But what did you say? Actually, it's optional. No, it's, it's the second the second generation was a facelift of the of the Mark One. So the Mark II Mondeo was really nothing but a facelift. But it kind of got called over here in the UK as the Mark II and it stuck as the Mark II. So when the Mark III came out, technically the Mark III would have been the Mark II, but they called it the Mark III. So <laughs> it's like whatever they call it over in Europe I don't know but over here the Mark II although it was a facelift it ended up being called a Mark II I think it's a genuine Ford factory in China not to be compared with MG in China because they own it unlike Ford in China <laughs> I tell you what, whatever's in China, it'd be monitored by the CCP. My John 64, rusty, rusty red. See, someone's trying to help you out <laughs> with that colour. My dad had it, the two litre Duratec automatic, 2004 from 2008 to 2018. And it had a water pump problem and the water starts to boil. Yeah, the impeller comes off the shaft or spins on the shaft. So it's not, it's not, although the cam belt's turning the water pump pulley, it's not turning the impeller. So the water's not getting circulated around the engine and it starts to boil up. Is this the factory? Is this the factory fault or something else for the pump? It was always boiling. So he bought bought as the used car and the odour before him. Now it's just a dodgy pump. I've had loads of them. They're not very good water pumps. They're, they're a bit of a bad design. They're expensive water pumps, but I've had quite a lot of them. The impellers just come, come loose. They're a plastic impeller on a steel rod. And the plastic wears on the rod and just gets loose they don't circulate the water. It's just a bad design. Australia is an amazing country to visit, all right, but the government is riddled with weapons grade assholes. Avoid until the local problems are. Yeah, well, I, well, I did hear during the pandemic, they've tried to enforce curfews and God knows what and shut businesses, well, as, as pretty much as they've done over here but in a much bloody uh, worse way. Yeah. Yeah, so I've, I, have, I have seen. I do, I do watch, uh, I don't know if you see him, I do watch uh, Avi Yamini from Rebel News. So I see him in, in Australia, um, where all the protests were for the anti-lockdowns and all that. So I do know they've got some bloody uh, right left-wing politicians over there trying to destroy the country and put everyone out of business. Mm. It's sad. Here is our English Allen man. <laughs> I, I don't know whether I'm English or what anymore. <laughs> Hello, Kenna. Hello, darling. Don't worry if the world ends today. It's already tomorrow in Australia. 
Yeah, that's right. Organic cold. I don't trust main dealers for a reason. Yeah. Yes, you can't trust them all the time. You would like to think you can take your car there and you'll just get your problem resolved, but it, it really happens that way, doesn't it? Uh, what whiskey are you drinking? I am drinking Jack Daniels Honey. <laughs> I had the regular JD, but I've used all that. But I've got the I've got the honey version. It's a bit easier on the throat. There, it's gone. My Mark V keeps keeps what? Geating rear passenger caliper season. Is it common and why does it happen? I should think it's just a faulty caliper. I should think there's something wrong with the caliper. You do get a faulty one here and there. I've had a few faulty ones. So it's probably just best just to change it if you can find one. Uh, that's a reasonable problem. You could probably go for a second-hand one off eBay because they're not cheap, are they? I have put petrol on diesel engine by mistake. Was just fifteen pounds. After that, I put diesel on and still works on the Nissan Qashqai. <clears throat> yeah, because it, it's the other way round. If you put diesel in a petrol, you're in the shit. But if you put petrol in a diesel, the thing to remember here is the diesel oil, which is what it is, diesel fuel is oil, lubricates your high pressure fuel pump. So if you get petrol in your diesel and there's too much petrol. It can wash the inside of your pump and cause wear and cause more problems down the road. But if you've got a certain amount of petrol in your diesel fuel and you top it up with, with more diesel, sort of like to thin the petrol out, then chances are you'll be perfectly fine and you won't even notice it. You look what a lot of lorry drivers do when it's really cold conditions. They will put a bit of petrol in their diesel to stop the diesel from, fry, from freezing. So uh, as long as there wasn't too much petrol in it and you fill the rest of the tank up with diesel, then you'll be fine. We have lots of drivers that have put petrol in the diesels. You just fill them up. I mean, in most cases, unless they've filled it up to the brim and you've got to drain it out, if any, most of them, they'll put about 10, or 10, 10 pounds worth of bloody petrol in, then realise what they've done. So just put another 10, 15 pounds worth of diesel in, it'll be fine. Hello, Steve. Yeah, I'm going to knock it on the head in a minute. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have another go next weekend. Hello, I have a Ford Focus 1.8 TDCI 2010 that has a random judder that happens on roundabouts and driving around town at slower speeds. Any ideas? No, nope, I think you'd have to put... <laughs> It's, it's once again, a lot of these things, you have to put the scanner on and read fault codes and see what comes up because it could well point you in the direction you, that's what the problem is. And you can't, I mean, unlike cars of old where you could, you could just look at stuff because there was no ECUs and all this stuff, you would have to, to fault find manually. Nowadays, Normally, if anything, you take, a, you take a car, most cars, if, if, if there's a problem with one of the cylinders, one of the cylinders starts misfiring, the ECU would detect that, and it will log a fault code for that particular cylinder. So it will point you in the right direction straight away. So it's well worth getting, it, uh, getting the ECU codes read first. <coughs> Bugger, I have missed it. To, uh, don't worry, you haven't missed much. <laughs> Toyota Caetano, Portuguese bus. Caetano is a Portuguese company. They built the National Express buses. Yeah, that, that Caetano was a flipping, do you know what? It was, a, it was a bloody turd from the beginning. The engine in it, you want to hear this bloody story then. The engine in it 
was knackered when we got the bus. And I wasn't the one who went and picked the bloody bus. Somebody else did that, and they picked it with a knackered engine, right? So when we got the bus, I had to take the engine out of that bus, and I took it out through the inside of the, of the bloody bus. There's a big hole in the floor. I couldn't take it from underneath. I couldn't drop the engine from underneath the bus. I had to take the engine out from inside the bus. And it was like, oh, God almighty, what a palaver. It's like a four-litre flipping engine. Heavy thing it was. We got an engine imported from another country because there's none in this country. And guess what? That engine was buggered as well. There was something wrong with the crankshaft shells were burnt, weren't knackered. So in the end, that bus went to the scrap the odd in the fucking sky. That's all I can say. It was nothing but aggravation. It was a nice looking little bus, but because of the engine problems we had a bit, and we couldn't get a decent engine for it, that was it. It, it just went eventually. After many hours changing engines, sort of like for no for no reason, getting nowhere. Where does the height adjustment sit on the Ford Mark V in the headlight? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a motor inside the headlight. It's not an external motor, it's an internal motor. So if it goes wrong, you have to buy a new headlight. There's nothing you can do about it. They're like a sealed unit. It's all inside the headlight. My daughter's car has full Audi service history. I contacted the dealers to ask how a pattern oil filter got fitted. It came to, because it had an oil leak and I needed fixing quick. The mechanic pointed out. No. <laughs> you would think if you take it to a dealer, you'd get dealer parts put in it, proper genuine Audi parts for... Yeah, maybe, maybe they're cutting costs. You want to see the Audi dealer here in Huntingdon. It's a big flash place. You, you'd like to think they'd fit genuine parts. <clears throat> Managed to change cam belt base on your tutorial. Oh. Yeah, well, I do try and pull it out sort of like as clear as I possibly can so it could be followed. But well done. Oh, that the, the oil fil filter was loose and was not a genuine Audi part, which paid for. Yeah, that's not very good, is it? Yes, you're right to complain about that. Right, anyway, I'm going to... Uh, what's the time? Flipping it, I've been going for nearly two hours. I was only supposed to go for an hour. Anyway, guys, I'm going to call it a night. I will put it back on next Wednesday for another round. Maybe Kevin will join me again at some point and we'll talk about another car. Who knows? I'll think, I'll think of something to talk about. But anyway, thank you, everybody, for watching tonight. And uh, I guess I'll see you all in the next one, which will probably be maybe tomorrow night. Maybe what is, what is today, by the way? This is Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. No, probably Friday and Saturday. I've got two videos to upload, which I've made. One is actually on an Audi, Audi A1, which came in, which was, I thought it was an interesting little problem. I'll give you a little sneak. It was like Audi A1, 1.6 diesel. You could try and drive it in the yard, in our yard. You couldn't, you, it, the engine would not rev over two and a half thousand RPM. If I held my foot flat out on the throttle, it was like it was like the turbo wasn't working whatsoever and the revs wouldn't go up and it just wouldn't wouldn't go properly it was slow as hell and uh we've got the answer to it we've, we've kind of like diagnosed what's wrong with it and i'm going to bring it out in the video and the other one which i'm going to put out is uh 2012 voxel astra the daytime the, the daytime running lights aren't working not working at all and it's like i can't work this shit out <laughs> it's like i changed both these aren't the leds 
LED daytime running lights. These are the filament bulbs. They've got two like, if you know what a 501 capless bulb looks like, it's a bigger version of that with two filaments in it. Five watt for your side lights and 15 watt filament for your daytime running lights. So in daylight, when you switch your, start your car up, it's got an automatic mode. The daytime running lights should come on and your headlights should be off. So, but that wasn't happening. If the headlight, if you turn the headlights off altogether, the daytime running lights wouldn't come on. So we worked it out though. I'll come to an answer on that one, which I found, I thought was quite interesting. So I'm going to put that video out. They're only short little videos anyway, of just little curious things I'm coming across. So I think I'll just bang it out there. But anyway, that'll be for the weekend. And then there's, there's another one I've got to do. Well, it's actually got a Mark V Mondeo. And this is, this is a bizarre one. This is, I've only had this once, but I will make a short little video on it. I was driving this Mark V Mondeo, two litre diesel. I left where I work and within a quarter of a mile, I was just driving this taxi home just to get home for no apparent reason, just needed a car to get home in. Got a quarter of a mile down the road and the car just lost power. And I thought, what the hell? And as I pulled over and uh, it, I, I'm sure I talked about this last week, it was the brake light switch the brake light switch caused the bloody fr the, the ECU to stop the throttle from working. So it's like, but well, I'll, I'll make that video anyway for the weekend probably. But anyway, I'm going to call it a night. I know there's still quite a few of you with a few questions, but uh, it's just there's too much to answer and I'll, I'll be here all night otherwise. So thank you everyone for watching. Have a good night out there. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks a lot, everyone.